Yeah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. And we'll be looking at verses 16 through 20. And my sermon title this morning is Followers of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand if you are able for the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16 from the book that we love, says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this day and just want to give you thanks, first and foremost, for the privilege to live in a nation where we can come and freely worship you, God. And we thank you, God, for our fathers here at RCLA. We thank you, God, for the the great men that you have blessed us with here, and we just pray that you would encourage them and bless them on this special day. And even more so, Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are our Heavenly Father. And though many of us may not have had an earthly father Uh, We know, Lord, that we now have a Father who is faithful to us, who is always there, who cares for us, and who will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for your word, and we just pray, Lord God, that at this time, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my own heart, God, would would be pleasing in your own sight. Pray that you would forgive me my own imperfections, God, in this most holy task of preaching thy word. Pray that you would give me unction to preach it. Thank you for the privilege. And most of all, I thank you for him in whose name I come. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. In a professional boxing match, there are three individuals in the ring. There are two fighters who are in perpetual conflict with one another. These two individuals will bring violence they will bring chaos into the ring. At the same time, there is a third person in the ring, that is the referee. Now, the referee is not on the side of either fighter. He is simply there to exercise his job, and his job is to enforce the rules of the organization. He has been given a commission by the powers that be to bring the rules of the organization up there down to the chaos down here. Now he will make some calls that will cause the crowd to praise him, and he'll make some calls that will cause the crowd to boo him. But that is completely irrelevant to the referee. The referee is not there for a popularity contest. The referee is simply there to fulfill his commission given to him by his authorities. He is there to do his job. You and I, have also been given a commission from the king up there to represent him in the chaos down here. Now, this event that we just read about in Matthew chapter 28 is known as the Great Commission, okay? And it is a meeting that Jesus called after his resurrection and right before his ascension into heaven. Now, there are three groups that attended this meeting. Okay, there are 11 disciples, minus Judas Iscariot. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that there was 500 people that attended this meeting. That includes the, the 11 disciples. That is the second group. And then the text says in verse 20, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Or some translations say, the end of the world. Now, This age has not yet ended. Therefore, you and I are at this meeting as well. 
We are the third group. Now, the commission that Jesus gave to the 500 has been given to you and I as well. So, it is imperative that we ask ourselves, what is this commission that we've been given? The text says that we have been commissioned to make disciples. That is the commission, to make disciples. And now, the question that we have to ask ourselves then is, what is a disciple? And that is what I want to teach this morning. That is my proposition. And that is, a disciple is a person, man or woman, who is constantly operating under the rule of Jesus Christ in his or her life. Let me say that one more time. A disciple is a person, man or woman, who is constantly operating under the rule of Jesus Christ in his or her life. And now I have three points that I want to teach this morning. Number one, I want to give a word about authority. That is verses 16 through 18. I want to give a word about activity. That is verses 19 through 20a. And then lastly, I want to give a word about ability. That is verse 20b. So authority, activity, ability. First point, a word about authority. This is verses 16 through 18. Let me read these once again. It says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, we see here that Jesus is being worshipped, which means that Jesus is God. This is a testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ, because only God can receive worship. Now, Jesus at this point in time has successfully completed the work of salvation. He is now exal exalted to his rightful place as God above all things. So this is after the crucifixion and after the resurrection already. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this speaks to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Now the belief in, Jesus, the, the, belief in the deity or that Jesus is God is an extremely important doctrine. You'll lose your soul if you don't believe this, by the way. It's very, very important that we understand this. And no one should search for God anywhere apart from Jesus Christ. He is the revelation and manifestation of who God is, for he is God himself. Colossians 1, 16 through 19 says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in, in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now, God is invisible, but Jesus is the image of the invisible God by whom we see the Father. He is the expressed image of the Father. You want to see the Father? You have to look to Jesus. Jesus himself said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The author of Hebrews tells us, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right of the majesty on high. Now, the entire gospel of Matthew stresses the authority of Jesus Christ. There was authority in his teaching. There was authority in his ability to heal the sick. He had the authority to forgive sins. And he even had authority over Satan. And then he delegated that authority to his apostles. Matthew makes it very, very clear. Jesus had all authority. Since Jesus Christ today has all authority, 
we may obey him in all things that he calls us to without fear. No matter where he leads us, no matter what the circumstances are, we can be sure and confident that he is in control. We have no excuse to be fearful. Now, in the ring, the fighters may be stronger, faster, more elusive, younger than the referee. The referee may be older, slower, and fatter, but that doesn't change the fact that the referee is going to get his job done. None of that is going to get in the way of him getting his job done. Why? Because he has been given authority. He has been given authority by the powers that be. The fighters may be able to put you down, but the referee will put you out. He has been given authority. Now, the world may look smarter and may look more powerful than the church. Your giants may look taller. They may look more unconquerable. But that won't stop the church from accomplishing its mission. Jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We have been given authority from the king to carry out our mission. Now, the Christian faith be sure of this, is a missionary faith. Okay, we are called to be on mission. Being a Christian is not just about coming to church on Sundays, though that is important. Sundays, however, are merely the day that we come to fuel up so that we might go out and live on mission. Now, Francis Chan illustrates it this way. Can you imagine if you went to a football game, American football, and the team went into their huddle. The coach gave them the play. They said, all right, let's do it. And they said, break. They go out, get into their formation. But before they do the play, they stop and they get back into another huddle. And the coach gives them the play again. And they say, great, break. They get into formation. And then before they do the play, they get back into another huddle. And they do that 10, 20, 30 times in a row. That would be strange, right? Well, that's what happens when we as Christians come to church. The pastor gives the instruction. You guys say amen. You leave. You do nothing. And then you just come back again on Sunday and do it all over again. We have to play the play. Last week, we were in the book of Acts, and we saw how the Holy Spirit fell on the church to empower them for ministry. Well, when you continue to read the book of Acts, you find that they turned the world upside down, the scripture says. How? How did they do that? They were able to do that because Jesus gave them the authority to do that. They get, and they acted on that authority. They trusted on that authority and that authority alone. They didn't trust in their skills. They didn't trust in their giftings. They didn't trust in their positions. They didn't trust in anything or anybody else other than Jesus and the authority that he gave to his church. And we have been given that same authority. But sadly, most Christians don't want to submit to that authority. You know, Kurt uh, Bruner once said, many refuse to accept the reality of a personal God because they are unwilling to submit to his authority. And so that's, that's one of the main reasons why people don't come to Christ. You know, when you share the gospel with them, you talk to people about Jesus, your family members, your friends, whoever, and they reject him. The main reason they do that is because they do not want to submit to the authority of a personal God. They know that their life is going to have to change, and they don't want to. They love their sin too much. Sadly, a lot of Christians think that they have actually surrendered to the authority of Jesus, but in reality, they haven't. Sure, they say they believe in him. Sure, they come to church on Sundays. But if you're not living out the Great Commission, you have not truly submitted to the authority of Jesus because this is the main thing that he has called us to. And so you have to ask yourself, are you fully submitted? Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. So we see that Jesus has all authority, and we have been given the privilege to act on that authority. Now, point number two, I want to give a word about activity. A word about activity. And this is verses 19 through 20a, the first part of verse 20. It says, Go therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So now a word about activity. 
The activity or the mission that we are called to is to baptize and teach disciples. That is the activity we are called to. This is speaking of water baptism, by the way, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we spoke about last week. We don't, we don't administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Only God administers the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We administer water baptism in the triune name, the one name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, it is very important that you understand the following. We are not all called to the office of teaching like I am, like Pastor Rudy is. Okay, there's the office of teaching, okay? But everyone, every single Christian is still called to teach disciples. Every single one of you is called to teach disciples. Now, this is a very serious task that we have been given. We are not called to share feel-good messages or motivational speeches. We must preach the Word of God and only the Word of God and all of the Word of God, not leave any of it out. Remember how the referee, the referee will make some calls that will cause people to praise him and make other calls that will cause people to boo him? Well, in the same way, we're going to teach things as Christians that are going to cause people to praise us, and we're going to teach other things that are going to cause people to hate us. But like the referee, that should be irrelevant to us. We are called by an authority given a commission to fulfill here and whether it gives us praise or it brings hate we are to fulfill that we cannot tamper with god's word and only deliver what we what we feel people would like to hear right so that we can be popular with people well if i only teach these aspects of christianity my family will still like me but if i start teaching all that stuff that pastor chris is talking about they're not, they're not gonna like me anymore that should be irrelevant to you. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, Paul tells us, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Again, I can't stress this enough. Don't get caught up in this nonsense, cowardly version of Christianity that only says what people want to hear and stays away from the truth that will offend. Okay, stay away from that. There will be consequences to believing things like that. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3-5 through says, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity, or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. Your best friend is not the one that tickles your ears. Your best friend is the one that teaches you truth. You can find teachers out there that will tickle your ears. Okay, believe me, they're a dime a dozen. They will, they, you, 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 can, you can find them and, and they'll take your money and, and, you, and you'll fill up their pews and they'll tell you what you want to hear, but in the end, you're going you're gonna to pay the consequences for that. You will pay the consequences for that because those are lies. The truth, that is what it's all about. We must teach and believe the truth. People everywhere right now are believing lies. Why? Because it makes them feel good. But again, there will be consequences. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Paul admonishing his son in the faith, Timothy, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then later on in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he tells them, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit 
their own passions. And the time is not coming. The time is here. We're living in those days. This is what we are called to. We are called to preach the truth to our disciples. We are called to go and preach the truth to disciples. Now, you can study the word go in Hebrew. You can study the word go in Aramaic. You can study the word go in, in um, Syriac, Greek, English, or Spanish. And guess what? Go means just that. It means go. It means don't stay. It means go and do it. The term disciple was the most popular term for Christians in the early days. The followers of Jesus were most popularly called disciples. Today, we are only concerned with making converts, okay? But being a Christian is much more than just being a convert. We are called to be a disciple. Now, a disciple could be thought of as an apprentice. When you think of a disciple, think of an apprentice. Okay, somebody who comes alongside somebody, learns from them, not only by listening, but also by doing. They try to become like their master, like the person who is teaching them. They are an apprentice. Okay, you are an apprentice of Jesus. We, we can be apprentices of one another. You can have spiritual fathers in the faith. You can have people who disciple you. But nevertheless, we are called to be apprentices, disciples of the truth. We are called to be disciples. We are called to make disciples. Again, Jesus is not looking for fans. He is looking for followers. The pattern of the New Testament was a disciple was someone who believed, then was baptized, then remained in the fellowship of believers that he might be taught the truths of the faith. He then was able to go and win others to Christ and to teach them. So it's disciples making disciples who will then make disciples who will make disciples and on and on and on it goes. That was the New Testament pattern. In many respects, we have abandoned this pattern and we need to get back to it. And I'm not just saying us, I'm saying the church in general. Most churches, uh, the congregations expect the pastor to preach, win the lost, and grow disciples while the members merely function as cheerleaders. The members come on Sunday, clap their hands, then they go home and they completely forget about Jesus the rest of the week. Jesus is not looking for fans. He is looking for followers. Here at RCLA, we have many groups that you can get yourself plugged into where you can learn and be discipled. There's no excuses. I know this is a bit difficult, but Jesus is calling you into a difficult life. He is calling you into a life of submission to pick up your own cross and follow him. He is calling you out of your comfort zone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him, or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world. But it is the same death every time. Death in Jesus Christ. The death of the old man at his call. And my question to you is, are you stepping into this activity? Are you in the game? Are you in the fight? Examine your own life and see if you are truly being a disciple of Jesus. So we see that Jesus has been given all authority, and it is because of this authority that he calls us into a certain activity. Okay, he has the authority. He calls us into a certain activity based on that authority. Okay, now my third point is a word about ability. Okay, a word about ability. And this is verse 20b. A word about ability. It says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the face of all of your fears, in the face of all of your excuses, is this promise from Jesus Christ to be with you always and to ensure that you will succeed. Okay, that is a promise. And he does not promise you that you will succeed in sports. He does not promise you that you will succeed in business. He does not promise that you will succeed in all of your relationships. But he does promise that you will succeed at this, that you will succeed at fulfilling the ministry that he has given you. He promises you that. It's been well said that there are three stages to the work of God. Im impossible, difficult, done. It always looks that way. 
And so whatever God calls you to, it's usually going to look impossible. So when you sit there and you say, but God, I don't know if I can do that. He knows. That's exactly why he's calling you to it. But, I, but I'm not cut out for you. I know. That's why I'm calling you to it. So if you're looking to, uh, to, to join a ministry or you feel like God is prompting you to something, but you're kind of hesitant because you feel like you're inadequate or whatever, God knows that's why he gave it to you. And when you step into it, it's going to be just as difficult as you think it's going to be. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, just step into it and it'll be great. No, it might be really hard. It might be really hard, but it will always be worth it. And God will always make sure that you succeed at that. Now, the phrase, the end of the age, indicates that the Lord has a plan. He is the Lord of all history. And as we follow his lead and obey his word, we will fulfill his purposes here in the world. RCLA will fulfill the purposes of Jesus Christ here in Linwood. It will all come to a climax one day. Everything will end. Meanwhile, we are called to be faithful. And so we see that Jesus has the authority. He has given us the activity, and we have the ability to do that. And I pray that we would be faithful to it. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and just give you praise for your word, the word that both convicts and encourages. I pray, Lord, that we would walk away here convicted, Lord, and convinced that we are called to be your disciples. And that we don't need to be afraid, God, because you have all authority. You're, you're, you, you said, I'm not just in charge in heaven up there. You said, I'm in charge in earth down here. And I pray that we would remember that and know that in you, we are new creations. The old has passed away. All the old excuses are gone. We are now new men and women who are capable of being in victory. And we pray that. I pray that for each and every single person here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we have heard the word of God, and now it's time to come to the visible word of God. Hear now the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ that he's given us this gift so that we can remember the precious truths of the gospel and actually be able to see them visibly and partake of them and taste them. And the scripture also tells us, whoever therefore eats, of this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, we will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Please take a moment to examine yourselves before the Lord. Holy Spirit, strengthen our faith as we partake of the bread and cup. Together as one body, may we be united in hope and love until you, Lord Jesus, return again. Amen. Amen.